as Dr. McKnight mentioned, there's quite a few different subjects um, that we're going to cover across this panel today, so I'll just go ahead and kick us off. Um, I'm going to be talking about fish in Cambodia. So uh, just to give an immediate background, I studied abroad um, at the beginning of 2016 um, in Cambodia through the School for Field Studies, and I was looking at um, fish assemblage on the Telnay Sap. So just to give you a little context here, that's a map of Cambodia. Um, and the Tonle Sap is that big lake in the middle, and basically the country operates in kind of a rainy versus dry season um, shift. So during the rainy season, uh, the Mekong River, which flows down that way, um, floods and it floods back up into the Tonle Sap Lake, and the Tonle Sap Lake expands from that dark blue area that's in the dry season to the seasonally flooded area um, in the wet season. And so what happens when this when that happens is that it floods these gallery forests. So there's forests immediately around the lake that essentially fill up with water, uh, which introduces the terrestrial environment to the aquatic environment, um, which I'll get into in a minute here. That has a lot of impacts both on people living there as well as fish living in the lake. So in addition to uh, that having the impact as, on the fish, as I said, there are also floating villages around the lake. So this is an adaptation built so that people can live in this flood pulse system so that when the water rises, you don't have to pack up and move, or you don't have to always live far enough from the lake that your house will never flood. You essentially build your houses on these floating platforms so that your house moves as the lake level rises. So my research was in this area, um, this village of Prechtol, which is a floating village on the Tonle Sap. Uh, and that's a picture there. So those houses are essentially on like barrels that just float right above the water level. Um, so we were looking specifically at the seasonal variation of fish, fish assemblage and catch per unit effort in the Prechtel core area. Which is kind of a fancy way of saying we were looking at what kind of fish can you catch during the two different seasons, the dry season and the wet season, um, and how easy is it to catch them. So fish assemblage looks at what different species are caught, um, hop into this, so what different species are caught, what groups they belong to, whether they migrate during the seasonally flooded area or not. Um, and then their preferred habitat, whether that's a stream or the lake bottom, that sort of thing. Um, and then we calculated abundance, relative abundance, so what proportion of the species caught um, do each species represent essentially. And then catch per unit effort is the idea of how many fish or how many pounds of fish um, can you catch in a given amount of time with a given amount of effort essentially. So really that's just a measure of how easy is it to catch fish and how many fish are available for you to catch. And so we were looking at this between the high and the low water season. Um, so just to go back for a minute, I'll show you kind of the uh, study area. So as I mentioned, this here is Perktol, the village we were staying in. It's along the stream at the base of the Tonle Sap. And there's several different um, fishing lots and areas that across <coughs> the uh, Tonle Sap as well as the flooded area around the Tonle Sap. Um, that allow for different fishing rights. So in these red boxes, you can see these are fishing lots, which is the government has given um, different companies rights to fish in those areas. But this core area, the black circled line, is an area where no one is allowed to fish. Um, and that's in an effort to preserve places where migratory fish species breed, um, and it allows people who live on the lake and are so reliant on these fish populations um, to be able to catch fish even um, if there are companies fishing for large amounts of fish. So if you had these big fishing lots covering everything, you wouldn't necessarily have fish for everyone else um, that maybe just fish for subsistence and that sort of thing. So that red arrow points to the exact study location where we caught fish each day. And the way that that works is that fish um, Ministry of Environment Rangers would go out and they would catch fish for us each day and they would bring back our fish catch and we would sit there we would identify all of the species, as I mentioned, we would count them, we'd weigh them, um, and then other students would dissect them for other research um, studies. So then we wanted to compare this data to the high water season. So I was there when it was uh, very dry, very hot, and the water levels were much lower. The previous November, other students on this study abroad program had done the exact same study, but during the high water season. So just to get into why we would expect those two seasons to look different, um, as I mentioned, the forest flood, and so that terrestrial and aquatic environment overlap actually introduces a lot of nutrients to the water. So this means that uh, a fish that might rely on uh, terrestrial prey, such as insects or other things, might have access to that during high water season differently than they do in the low water season. 
So after about 10 days of data collection, uh, we came out with, this shows the general abundance of fish, um, different fish families between the high and low water seasons. So the darker blue represents the high water season and the lower, lighter blue represents the low water season when I was there. Um, so you can see immediately that the most abundant family was in overlap between the two seasons. However, you can see the next two abundant families um, from the high water season were of relatively low abundance here and here, and um, the most abundant species during the low water season were of relatively low abundance during the high water season. So that shows immediately that there is some distinction between the two seasons just in the families represented. But it doesn't really paint a clear picture of what kind of functional groups those represent or why they would be different between those seasons. So to look at that, we looked at um, what kind of, or what these fish are preying on. So that gets into, as I mentioned, the aquatic and terrestrial environment overlap. So you can see in the high water season, we had extremely high numbers of insectivores. So that's species that are reliant on eating insects um, for their main prey. And in the low water season, we had extremely high numbers of piscivores. So the insectivores, the main reason we would expect that to be true, as we mentioned, would be that terrestrial overlap. It, you know, when you flood a forest, there's going to be lots of bugs and things that might not otherwise have been in the water now that fish have access to. So insectivores are going to do particularly well. The reason that piscivores may have been lower in the low water or higher in the low water season, excuse me, um, also fits in with our catch per unit effort values. So I'll show you those, and then I'll kind of come back and explain that. So as I mentioned, catch per unit effort is just a measure of how easy it is to catch fish by weight or how easy it is to catch fish by number. So uh, the top graph there shows by weight and the bottom graph shows by number of individuals per hour, whereas the top is grams per hour. Um, and you can see here in both cases, it was much easier to catch lots more fish essentially in the low water season. So that goes back to the ease that piscivores have to survive in this season. If you think about it um, like a bathtub full of water, if you have a bathtub completely full of water and you put fish in it, there's lots of space for the fish. But if you lower the water to about an inch of water, suddenly all of your fish are contained in that. So if you're a fish that eats other fish, it's much easier for you to catch that fish because there's so much less for them to be hiding in, essentially. And the same is true if you're a fisherman catching fish. So if the water is much lower, the nets that you set up are catching many more fish because they're covering so much more of the water depth or the water area, essentially. So those were the main findings we had. And this is particularly important, both from an ecosystem perspective, it's important for us to understand what the changes in seasonality represent and um, why they're occurring. And it's also important from a human perspective because so many people are reliant on the Tony sap in Cambodia as well as Southeast Asia as a whole. So about 75 to 80% of protein consumed <coughs> of all, in all of Cambodia comes from <coughs> those products in the Tone sap. Um, so that's a huge amount of protein that's coming in. It's a huge amount of, it's a huge representation of nutrition in this environment. Um, and it's also important just to the immediate community of Prectol that we were staying in. We saw every day after we finished dissecting fish, we would take those fish down to the kitchen and they would get them amongst community members. And then when we got down for lunch a couple hours later, we would also be served those fish. So we'd be able to recognize and identify which fish was fish that we had just measured, um, which grossed some of our classmates out a little bit, I think. Uh, but it also is important in terms of threats to the Tomli sap. So in terms of climate change, we're expecting to see um, strong shifts in those hydrological shifts. So if the rainy season becomes that much more rainy and the dry season becomes that much more dry, these differences are going to become even more pronounced. So it's important that we understand how they're occurring now so we can see how they begin to change and how we can expect it to them to change in the future. And it's also important because, as I mentioned, the Mekong River flows into the Tonle Sap um, and there's a number of hydropower dam projects installed along the Mekong as well as planned for the Mekong which could potentially impact um, this hydrological shift and how fish catch and assemblage is affected. Um, so some major research takeaways for me, it was a chance to um, really get involved in field work and get my hands dirty essentially and learn a lot on the ground in the field. Um, and it's also important, it's an important way to learn about how you have to be adaptable in any field work setting as I'm sure you'll hear from the future presenters here. Um, 
it, anything can change and really you're reliant on a lot of different um, opportunities as well as you know what time the rangers come back with our fish or what our fish catch looks like over the course of the day. Um, so it's just a very unique opportunity to learn an awful lot as well as gain a lot of important techniques and field skills.